Next three months, gold will come down to 1,800. You know what to do now so that you can benefit from that prophetic word. We, 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 we are put in a position, a position of advantage when we operate with the prophetic word of God because God is unknowing. God knows what will happen in the next three months, in the next six months of your life, in the next one year. Now, we have to depend on prophetic word to do exploits, to know what to do at the moment so that we can step into the prophetic word that God is giving to us. So prophetic means an accurate knowledge of the future. So that is why we have to pay attention when it has to do with prophecy, when it has to do with prophetic word, because that will prepare you on what to be doing on a daily basis so that you can achieve what God has prepared for you this year. Hallelujah. We cannot miss it when we are guided by the prophetic word. Joseph did not miss it. He became a governor in the land of Egypt by prophetic word. That's how he became a governor. Because what he knew, no other person knew, knew that. All the magicians, all the sorcerers, all the wise men of Egypt couldn't have that knowledge. But God gave it to Joseph. And based on that, Joseph became a governor in the land of Egypt. Every area of our lives that God has ordained that we should rule, we are going to rule this year in the name of Jesus. But we have to place value on the prophetic word. Hallelujah. Except you don't believe it. Then what is the meaning of periscope? Periscope means a long vertical tube containing a set of mirrors that gives you a view of what is above you when you look through the bottom of the tube. What this means is that with the prophetic word, you can see what others are not seeing. When they say prophetic periscope. The prophetic is like that periscope or is the periscope that enables you or that empowers you to see what others are not seeing. So that puts you in the position of a ruler. The Bible says that we reign in this life through Jesus Christ. And we can only do that when we are guided by the prophetic world. So the prophetic world is that periscope that enables you to see what others are not seeing and empowers you to prepare to experience the prophetic world. Hallelujah. The next one, I put shadow first because when it comes to the definition of season, there is schedule in the definition of season. So we have to understand what is schedule for us to understand what is season. Schedule means the plan and purpose of God. The plan and purpose of God. As we go further, we will we'll throw more light on this. But let me stay with the definition. Just take note of that. Shadow means the plan and purpose of God. Season means the period God has shadow. That is the period that God has ordained for his plan and purpose to happen in our lives. The period, you know, when you have a plan, you should, you should plan in time as a man. God does not plan as a man. As we go further, we understand why God does not operate according to natural time. God operates according to seasons. So season means the period God has scheduled his plan and purpose to happen in our lives. So I hope you got that. Definition of schedule and season. Then number two is why is it very important that we should know and understand God's seasons and schedule for our lives? Why are we learning about season and schedule? It's very important. The first thing I got from what pastor is teaching is that our God is a God of season and time. Our God is not disorganized. Nothing 
nothing tastes God, God unawares. It's a God of season and time. So that is why you have to pay attention when they are talking about the season and schedule of God. Because God cannot operate outside his seasons and outside his schedule. That is why it's very important that we should give attention when we are talking about the season and schedule of God. Number The second one is the season and timing of God is based on his internal schedule, not on natural time. You know, God, God does not plan our life when we, start, when, we are, when we start living, as in when we start existing here on earth. Before we arrive here, he, he has already settled the seasons of our life. You have to believe that. There is no area of your life that has not been settled by God. Man will look at things and start planning. But God plans before things. Before you arrive, he has a perfect plan for you. So what it means is that his plan is not based on you. It's not based on me. It's not based on Nigeria. It's not based on the world. It is based on his internal schedule that cannot be altered by men. Hallelujah. That takes me to the third one. Nothing can rewrite or erase the divine plan of God. You know, when it comes to the man, man can change his plans. They talk about vision 2020. Where are those things that they plan concerning vision 2020? We are in 2024. So man has limitations that can make his plan to change. But God's plan for us cannot change. No, no man can alter it. No situation can alter it. So that is why it's very important that we should rely on the seasons and schedule of God for our lives because it cannot be erased. It cannot be, nobody can rewrite the schedule of God, the plan and purpose of God for our lives. Hallelujah. Now, we all are here. You can agree with me, we are, as a believer, as a child of God, we are the product of the manifestations of his schedule. It is him that plans salvation. And today, we are all beneficiary of that plan. We are born again because of the shadow, the plan and purposes of, of God. You see how powerful that the plan of God is. I want us to read some scriptures. Let's look at Isaiah 46, verse 9 to 10. And the second Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Hallelujah. If you understand God's seasons and schedule for your life, you will not worry. You will not be afraid. Because it must surely come to pass. That is why it's very important that we should understand when pastor is teaching about the seasons and timing of God. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. The next verse. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. You see, declaring the end from the beginning. No man can do that. That is why it is only divine shadow that man can rely on. You cannot rely on the schedule of man because man has a lot of limitations. So the Bible has confirmed that the seasons and schedule of God can never be altered because song that the choir sang, He is the Almighty God. Second Timothy chapter one, verse nine. Second Timothy chapter one, verse nine. The Bible says, who had saved us and called us with an holy calling, 
not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he has given us in Christ Jesus before the, before the world began. As you can see, there is nothing in this scripture that is talking about the plan and purpose of man. It is all God. And you, can, uh, you agree with me that this plan has already taken place. It has manifested. Number three. Two things we must never do in 2024 if we want to manifest divine schedule. Now we have the knowledge of season. We have the knowledge of schedule. Schedule is the plan and purpose of God for our lives. And season is the time that God has ordained for that plan to come to pass. It is not a plan that will uh, just last forever. There is a time for it to manifest. So season talks about that time. That time that it will manifest. Now, these two things you know, gave me an insight that, that blessed me. Because there are some things we do, we think that, you know, it depends on God. You know, it's God that will determine it. It's a sovereign God. No, no. We have a role to play. We have a role to play for God's season to manifest in our lives. We are not robots. We have a will. So those, these two things is our responsibility to make sure that it is not happening in our lives. Because that can prevent us from experiencing God's season for our lives. So we have to pay attention, we have to know it, we have to practice it with everything in us. Because they are very important. Number one is don't limit God. Don't limit God. What does it mean to limit God? To limit God is to forget who he is. This is what pastor gave to us, and he really blessed me. To forget who he is and all that he has done for you. If you have been following the Bible reading, if you read the Old Testament, one thing that you will constantly know is that the children of Israel, they easily forget who God is and all the things that he has done for them. And that is why they were constantly limiting God in their midst. God called them disobedient and stubborn people. Grace does not take this away. In fact, grace has empowered us to be able to do it. So let's look at Psalm chapter 78, verse 41 to 42. Psalm chapter 78, verse 41 to 42. Hallelujah. Psalm 78, 41 to 42. Okay. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Next verse. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. The Bible is very clear on that. So we cannot limit who God is as, in, as a God, but we can limit his participation in our lives. We can limit his, his participation in our lives. So how do you limit God? To forget who he is and what he has done and start looking at the things around you and be speaking from there. When you start speaking how the things, the things of the world, how things are, you have started limiting God. So if you want to know how to limit God, take your eyes off who he is and what he has done and begin to see the things around you. That is, just know that you have started limiting God. You're telling God that I am not interested in this your schedule. I'm not interested in this your season because I don't trust you. So, so we have to constantly remember 
who he is and what he has done. If you remember that God's schedule cannot change. And the time he has ordained it to happen cannot be altered. You will rely on him. The Bible says those that trust, put their trust in the Lord. They are ma like Mount Zion that can never be defeated. So it's very important that we don't limit God this year. Hallelujah. It is a personal decision. Nobody can make that decision for you. You have the Holy Spirit in you, the enabler. The Bible says he is the greater one that lives in us, which means that there is no situation that can make you to limit God because the greater one is in us to help us to overcome. Hallelujah. The second one is don't help God. Don't help God. Now, if you check the meaning of help in the dictionary, you will know that it's even foolishness to try to help God. Just check the meaning of uh, help in the dictionary. Let me read out the help, the meaning of help from the dictionary. It says help means to make it easier or possible for someone to do something by offering one's resources. How do you imagine? A man, man wants to help God. You know, when you are faced with a challenge, you have to make a decision. Because either you, you desire the help of men or God. There is no middle line. I'm at the center. Anything that looks as if, that makes you to not value God and his word, that thing will be judged. Because God cannot back up anything that is not from him. He will allow you to do what you like or to, to that, that man that looks as if he's your God. He will allow you to, do, to follow him. But I tell you, the Bible says, by strength shall no man prevail. If any man succeeds with the help of men, you put your trust in men, that man has broken the scripture. So this year, we will not try to help God. Because the Bible says we are not sufficient to think of anything as being from ourselves. He said our sufficiency is from God. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, verse 27, uh, 27, it says Jesus Christ looked at them and said, with men it is impossible. But not with God, for with God all things are possible. Hebrew 13, verse 5. God is our helper. Let's look at Psalm 60, 11 to 12. Psalm 60, 11 to 12. Hallelujah. Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of men. Of man. So this, this, this is the word of God. No man can break it. That man that you put your trust in will eventually disappoint you because vain is the help of man. Last scripture on this don't help God. Philippians 4, verse 13. Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Hallelujah. It is wise for you to trust God as your helper. It's a wise thing to do. And you will never, never be disappointed because God has all it takes to help us. Hallelujah. Now, let's look at the fourth one and the last one. This, this fourth one, the first pillar really blessed me. I really went into it deeply. Three prophetic pillars. Three prophetic pillars. Now, when you talk about pillar, from my own understanding, because, you know, for you to really, the meaning of 
understand means to know how something works as a technical guy. You know, if you have maybe a theory, as a technical guy, if you've, no, if you've not practiced it, if you've not applied it, you don't really know how to, it works. So our, our aim as, as technicians is to really understand how something works so that we can fix it when it breaks down. So to understand means to know how something works. Hallelujah. So if, if something is a pillar of a system or a pillar of maybe whatever you're doing, what, what that means is that it is the most important part. No, we're not talking about pillar as in literally, you know, the cast that is holding a building, but I'm talking about system. Like this one is in terms of operation, how God works. So pillar means the most important part of a system or of a team, of an agreement. Now, so the reason why pastor say these are the three prophetic pillars is making us to understand that without this, these three pillars uh, will be like people that don't have direction. It means that it's our guide. It's what, it's what will determine what we do. The most important aspect of everything we do in your workplace, in, in taking care of your children, whatever you do, these three pillars, they are the most important things, uh, the pillars uh, that you have to focus on. Hallelujah. So the first one is to cooperate and flow with the Holy Ghost. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Zechariah 4, verse 6 to 7. Let's put that scripture on the screen. Uh, Zechariah 4, verse 6. To seven. There are insights here that really bless me. Zechariah 6, 4 verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Just like a prophetic word. Saying, Not by might nor by power. But by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts. Seven. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Because of the prophetic word that was given by the Spirit, thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. There is no mountain. That can stop you if you're running with the prophetic word. If the spirit is at the center of what you do. Now, this is from that uh, crossover service. I meditated on what pastor said. What it means to enter the rest of his grace. What it means to enter the rest of his grace. Remember the topic is the periscope for entering the rest of his grace. Now, he said something and I linked it to this. So this, um, the pillar of to cooperate and flow with the Holy Ghost. Now, Pastor, he said, he said, okay, he said that to enter the rest of his grace is to enter the finished work of Christ. To enter the rest of his grace is to enter the finished work of Christ. Now, look at, look, this is the connection I made you know, that will help me to, you know, explain what has blessed me. You see, the, the Holy Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit himself cooperates and flow with the finished work of Christ. Everything that, anything and everything that the Holy Spirit is doing here on this earth is based on the finished work of Christ. He cannot operate aside the finished work of Christ. So, to enter the rest of his... You have to meet the spirit there. He's there waiting for us. So, Pastor said to enter the rest of his grace is to enter the finished work of Christ. The spirit of God is already there. Because that is the foundation of cooperation. Hallelujah. Now, you cannot enter the rest of his grace without believing. 
Remember, believing, believing is what you consider to be true. You know, before I, you know, many years back, you know, I see, you know, the things of God as something that is not real. So we don't pay attention to it. And that is why we struggled. Struggled, make a, made a lot of mistakes in life. Because we are trying to, to break the scripture. So this is not a religious statement. To enter the rest of his grace is to enter the finished work of Christ. Because the Holy Spirit is there waiting for us. Everything and anything he will do here on earth is based on his finished work. Now, so how you enter is to believe. To believe what he has said and all the things he has done. To believe, to believe. To see it as your life depends on it. That you cannot, you cannot fulfill God's schedule for your life without it. Hallelujah. So let's look at John chapter 19, verse 30. To cooperate means to agree. To cooperate means to agree. This is the point of agreement. We all will have to, to cooperate. If you want to really cooperate with the Holy Spirit, you need to look at the finished work of Christ because that is the point of agreement. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Now, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Okay, that finished there. What are the things that are finished? What are the, because if you don't know these things, if you don't know them, you will, not, you will not see it as something that you have to do. You have to know them, you have to believe it, and you have to give yourself to it so that you can experience it. Now, let's look at the finished works. Now, let's look at the first one that I wrote here. The, the removal of sin and guilt. The removal of sin and guilt. Only the finished work of Christ can save man from sin and guilt. The consequences of sin. You know, pastor preached on that, but do we really understand it? Removal of sin and guilt. Now, as something I wrote here, the guilt of our sin was taken away from, from us and placed on Christ who discharged it by his death. The weapon of the devil is the weapon of guilt. See, if you don't believe this, that some people, when something happened to them, they want to trace back what they did. You know, what is it that my parents did? Because they don't believe this. They are focusing on sin. They are focusing on guilt. They are focusing on condemnation. It is the abortion that I did when I was young. That is why I'm not able to put to bed now as a child of God. And you believe that. You cannot enter the rest of his grace. The devil will use that guilt to hold you in bondage. Any area of your life that you believe that, for instance, you believe that you're poor because of the mistakes that you made or your parents made. You, the person will remain there because you don't believe the finished work of Christ. So, when you talk about sin and guilt, the consequence of sin is the guilt. When somebody sins, the guilt, the, you have the sin nice in the past, but the guilt can last for many years. That's a weapon in the hands of the devil. The Bible made us to understand that the finished work of Christ took care of not only the sin, but the guilt of sin. Hallelujah. So let's look at Romans 4.25 says that he was delivered up for our sins and he was raised for our justification. Let's look at uh, John chapter 1 verse 29. I'm going to run through this. 9.25. John chapter 1 verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So, for you to enter the rest of his grace in the area of guilt of sin, you have to believe that Jesus Christ has, has took care of it. Then you enter. 
you will be empowered to overcome that sin when you believe that it has been taken away, both the sin and the guilt. That's an empowerment. Then let's look at uh, Isaiah 53, verse 6. Isaiah 53, verse 6, the last scripture on this first pillar, uh, the finished work of Christ. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is what the finished work of Christ has done. Do you believe it? The second one, the second area we have to focus on to enter into the rest of his grace, grace by cooperating with the Holy Spirit is removal of rot. Uh, rot removal of rot. The fe this first one is known as uh, expiation. The second one, you know, it is only the future work, work of Christ based on what pastor taught us that can save us from hell and the vengeance of hell. Now, removal of rot. What is removal of rot? By dying in our place for our sins, Christ removed the wrath of God that we justly deserved. The death of Christ turns his wrath to favor. You know, if you're reading the Old Testament, you see anytime God is very angry with Israel, they do, there's what they call atonement. Atonement is what we know as to take away the wrath of God. Jesus Christ, his finished work, has done that. God is no more angry with us. You know, as a child of God, you feel that, oh, God is angry with me. That is why I'm going through this, this uh, uh, wahala. He's angry with me. Uh, what, I, what I've done made him to be angry. It means that you don't believe that the finished work of Christ has taken care of his wrath. God is a just God. Sin must be punished. He has done that. So for we to enter the rest of his grace in that area, we have to believe that the finished work of Christ has taken care of the wrath of God. Let's look at Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Romans chapter 3, verse 25 to 26. So this is what is known as atonement. Propitiation, atonement. The finished work of Christ did that for us. Romans chapter 3, verse 25 to 26. God, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That propitiation means atonement. That is what took away the wrath, of God, the wrath of God. To declare his righteousness for the remission of our sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Hallelujah. So, I've talked about two areas. The sin and the guilt of sin and the wrath of God. If we really want to enter the rest of his grace, we have to Know how this thing works. Like I said, my definition of understanding is to know how something works. And God has given us his spirit for we to know how he works. If you don't know how God works, you've not understood him. And if you know how something works, you don't practice it. It will not be part of you. I can tell you that from experience. The knowledge you know is the one you practice, not the one you talk about. The one you practice. In, a, in my profession, anything that you don't practice, you cannot become a professional in it. You must know how to handle things. Because when, maybe the day they will call you to do it is the day that the MDs, the top guys will be looking at you. You, you, you don't have that time to be doing like Elena. So before you, 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 you get to that point, you need to practice, practice, so that you will know how this thing works. So if you don't practice this, because the devil will come. The weapon of the devil is the gift of sin. We, we, he, he no longer has that power to do us anything as a child of God. It's what he uses. So you, this knowledge is very key. Then, removal of separation. Re, that's what we call reconciliation. It's only the finish of God can reconcile you to God. Because of our sin, we, we are separated from God. We, we are separated from God. But the finish work. You know, some people, when something happens to them, they refuse to come to church. They are angry with God. The finished work of Christ has made you one with God. Why are you separating yourself from, from God? Let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 10 to 11. 
the finished work of Christ has reconciled us to God. Nothing can separate us from God. Nothing can separate us. If you feel that God has left you, then it means that we have entered another place that pastor talked about, struggle. Romans 5, verse 10 to 11. The Bible says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled, hallelujah, to God by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We have been reconciled. Hallelujah. So these things that I'm listing, if you really want to cooperate, cooperate with the Holy Spirit this year, it must be strong in your mentality. It must be strong in your actions. It must be strong in your experiences. Hallelujah. The last one is redemption. Redemption. Our sin had put us in captivity from which we need to be delivered. You know, when Okay, I don't want to use that term because it's prevalent. I don't like to talk about what is going on. You know, there's some word that people use that as a child of God, you can't use it like talking about kidnappers. I don't like talking about it. If you want to experience it, be talking about it. So I wanted to use illustration for that. So I said no. So, you know, the price, let me put it this way, the price that is paid to deliver somebody to deliver someone from captivity is called ransom. You know, when somebody is in bondage, we are bondage under course. If you read Deuteronomy, we are going to read that scripture, Deuteronomy 28, 15 to 20, you will really understand what it means by redemption. We were all in bondage, bondage of sickness, bondage of poverty, bondage of, if you read Deuteronomy, you see all the bondage. That is where we are because of sin. Everybody in the world. But the finish of Christ paid the ransom. Hallelujah. The ransom for... Imagine a believer thinking that he's in bondage. There is no way you can enter rest in that area. You cannot. The price has been paid. The ransom has been paid. We have been redeemed from the cause of the law. You know, the law has punishment. If you read Deuteronomy, eh, they are much poverty, sickness. Nothing works for the person. That is where everybody will wear because of sin. Now, a, a ransom has to be paid because God is a just God. The finished work of Christ paid that ransom. Through his death, he paid that ransom. Hallelujah. The ransom of the cause, the ransom of guilt of sin, the ransom of power of sin, it has been paid. So let's look at these three scriptures quickly. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 to 14. Christ has redeemed us from the cause of the law. You see, you will not understand this scripture eh, if you don't understand the cause. You will not appreciate this scripture if you don't understand the cause. <laughs> I'm telling you. You need to read the cause. See what you have been delivered for. You'll be thankful as a child of God. So for we to enter rest, you have to know that Christ, through his finished work, has redeemed us from the cause of the law, the cause of sickness, the cause of poverty. Be made a cause for us. That is the ransom. That is the ransom that was paid. For it is written, cause is everyone that hungered, hungered on the tree. Hallelujah. Let's look at Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Romans 3, verse 24. Romans 3, verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ. Redemption that is in Christ. Which means that if you, somebody is going through the guilt of sin, thinking that it's what the father, is what he did in the past, that is making him to not, to not pros 
prosper, to not move forward, it means that you're suffering from the guilt of sin. Being justified freely. We have been justified. We have been justified freely by his grace through the redemption, the ransom. Anytime you see redemption, think about ransom. A price was paid for our freedom. Redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Lastly, on this, uh, Peter, uh, Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 to 19. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 to 19. I should be concluding. For as much as ye know that ye we are not redeemed. You know, it's not money that, that God is redeeming, redeeming us. We are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Next verse. But with the precious blood of Jesus, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, that was the ransom. Hallelujah. The last one is defeat of the power of darkness. Defeat of the power of darkness. Defeat of the power of darkness. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 to 15. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people are afraid of the power of darkness. Afraid of the things that the devil can do to them. Meanwhile, the finished work of Christ has taken care of it. We cannot enter rest in, an, in this area if we don't believe that the, power, the, the finished work of Christ has defeated the power of darkness. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, had, had he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You know, the weapon of the devil uh, is to tell you that you're not forgiven. He uses guilt of sin a lot to hold people in bondage. The Bible has made us understand that he has forgiven us of all our trespasses. But the devil will say, no, that one that you did that year, you're still suffering it. When you believe it, you cannot enter rest in that area. Next verse. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, naming it to, the, to his cross. Hallelujah. As you can see, the, the, the Bible is revealing the power of darkness, which is the guilt of sin. That's what he uses. So it is very important for we to know this. I'll just run through. We have two other pillars. Now, what the Holy Spirit revealed to me is that they see this first part cooperating and flowing with the Holy Spirit. Is an empowerment for we to for we to experience the open door of opportunities. We will struggle the two the two other pillars. This is the solution. Because you cannot be walking and be standing on the finished work of Christ and not experience the open doors of opportunity. You can, and you struggle. No. It is impossible. When you stand on the finish work of Christ, that is, that is what it means to cooperate and flow with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot flow with you according to, according to anything aside, aside what Christ has done. So, it has to be strong in our mentality. That's why Pastor said that we have to prepare we have to sense and we have to connect. To prepare means you have to equip yourself through word, the word and prayer with the finished work of Christ. Equip yourself, equip your mind, equip what you do with the finished work of Christ so that this season, this season of, of our open doors of opportunity, opportunity speaks of, Pastor said, opportunity speaks of timing. Timing, see the timing. God has ordained a lot of things to happen in our lives according to his own schedule this year. So the prophetic periscope is for us to cooperate and flow with 
the Holy Spirit. Alignment, alignment. I, asked, I told my wife, if somebody, I asked her last Sunday, if somebody asks you to pick out one word, or one word that appeared in everything that pastor preached, when it has to do with our own responsibility, one word, one word. She couldn't remember. I gave it to her. Alignment, alignment. Alignment is in the first pillar. Alignment is in the second pillar. Alignment is in the third pillar. What are we aligning to? Aligning to the finished works of Christ. You have to believe it. You have to know it. You have to believe it. You have to know how it works. We have the Spirit of God to teach us how it works if you want to know. Hallelujah. As you all know, the third pillar is we have to stop struggling and enter into the rest of his grace. The struggle is as a result of the cause that the finished work of Christ has taken care of. When you believe that you are not poor, first of all, you believe that you are not poor because of the finished work of Christ. When you start speaking poverty, you start speaking hardship, it means that you don't believe it. And you don't want to know how it works. So, it is very important that this year, you have to place value on the finished work of Christ by knowing what he has done, the finish, what his, the finished work of Christ has accomplished. Your own, your own personal study, you know, it shows value. When you want to, whatever you want to know shows the things you value. Have you sat down, this finished work of Christ that they are talking about every time, let me, let me know them. Let me know how it works. It is our responsibility to do that. It is not the responsibility of anybody. Let the cares of this world not make us to not experience the rest of his grace. This is in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's rise up on our feet. Let's pray this simple prayer. I like praying simple prayers. I feel that they are powerful if it's from your heart. Holy Spirit, help me to cooperate and flow with you. Holy Spirit, help me to cooperate and flow with you this year.